it's kind of interesting to think about this, that Christ could have gone throughout the world and healed every single person. But he didn't do that. And you wonder why. And it seems like these healings are obvious examples of something that Christ is accomplishing on a bigger, but also a more hidden level. Okay, hey, welcome everyone to the Orthodox Christian Podcast, and today we are looking at the first sections of Mark's Gospel, which are focused on Christ creating a new community of Jews and Gentiles, as well as offering some parables and other teachings. But before we get into that, just a couple things to mention. First is I'm not a Orthodox priest. I'm not an official spokesperson for the Orthodox Church. So just take this as my opinion. My intention in showing these videos or making these videos is to just give an example of how to interpret scripture in a more symbolic or allegorical way because this is very common in orthodoxy but also I think it's very helpful in our time because typically in people's conception of the world in the western hemisphere at least the um, notion that God and the world are connected is um, becoming harder to see and understand and we just are blind to this reality more often than not so it's my intention that by seeing scripture in this way, it's a practice to then see the world in this way that um, is connected with God, which is very important for being a Christian. I think it's why we in the Orthodox Church have so many practices that are tangible and embodied because God comes to us in very physical um, ways that need to be embodied. So it's not just this ethereal thing floating out there. Um, so that's one thing to mention. The other thing is that throughout Mark's gospel, my thesis is that it is about the revelation of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ re reveals himself as God incarnate, the center point of history, come to judge and save humanity through his death and resurrection and create a new community of Jews and Gentiles. So that's sort of like the big picture. And then in particular, the section that we're looking at today it's about Christ creating this new community of Jews and Gentiles. So you'll see that theme emerging a lot. And I'm going to make a couple videos on this section and um, try to cover each verse and just give sort of a general commentary. I've already published stuff on um, the feedings that Christ uh, performs later in this section. But just to give you the bookends, because typically the Gospel of Mark is structured by bookends, the uh, start of this section begins with Christ calling the disciples, specifically the fishermen, and the fishermen are people who collect things, and then later he also calls a tax collector, someone who collects things, and then at the end of this section, uh, Christ asks the disciples how many baskets they collected when the Jews and Gentiles were fed, and so this structure shows that throughout this section, Christ is gathering a new community of Jews and Gentiles, and the disciples are the ones who are tasked with collecting these people. And this will be their task after Christ resurrects from the dead. So I think if you have that particular point in mind, it helps to make sense of the various pieces that we'll encounter throughout. So I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, and um, I'm just looking at chapter 1 right now after the introduction. So this is in chapter one, verse 16. And here we go. So as Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. So when Jesus is passing along the Sea of Galilee, the setting is really important because throughout this section, uh, Christ will be at the Sea of Galilee repeatedly. And if you start to pay attention to that, you notice some things that are pretty interesting. So one is that throughout um, the Sea of Galilee moments, the crowd is growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And the same is true when Christ goes home to Capernaum, the crowd goes bigger and bigger and bigger. And the point of this, I believe, is Christ is gathering this new community. And so you see the community gathering around him and it expanding. So there's that side of it. But then from a symbolic point of view, you can think of the arrangement where you have Christ beside water and then this crowd gathering around him. And this is very similar to the arrangement of the Exodus, where God led the Jews to the water of the Red Sea, and then they crossed through. This is very similar to the conquest of the Promised Land, where, again, God led the Jews to the Jordan River, 
and then they crossed through. So it seems that in both of these stories, you had God at the front, like in the Exodus, it was the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, and then the Israelites following. And then the same thing is true with the conquest of the promised land, or when they're going into the promised land, it's actually the Ark of the Covenant that's at the front of the group. And this was known as the throne of God. So you have God or what is representing God at the front of the group, and then the group surrounding and water in front. And so lo and behold, when Jesus is teaching, it's very similar to that where you have God as Jesus Christ, and then the water behind him as the Sea of Galilee, and then the group, uh, the people listening, surrounding him. And so this is a new exodus for a new people of God. It is a new conquest of a new promised land that is not so much a geopolitical reality, but more the rule of God in people's hearts, that they would orient themselves towards God, whether they are Jew or Gentile. So that's significant. And then there is a boat that appears in these scenes when Christ is next to the Sea of Galilee. So initially he goes and teaches by the sea. There's no boat. The second time there is a boat on standby. The third time there is a boat and he gets into it and teaches. And the fourth time he gets into the boat and he crosses to the other side. The reason this is significant on one level is just to show the popularity of Christ because there's this growing crowd. And so there's this necessity of getting into the boat to be able to actually address everyone. And this shows that this new community is growing, but also it is connected with this theme of the Ark of Noah, which preserved the community in a time of flood. And there are many connections with flood imagery in the gospel of Mark. So Christ sends out the disciples two by two, just like the animals were uh, gathered into the ark two by two. And then later on, Christ says in Jerusalem, um, if you have faith, you can cast this mountain into the sea. And sometimes we think about that as the mountain moving into the sea. But I think a better way to understand that is that the mountain stays where it is and the sea rises above it. And that's the way it's cast into the sea because it's evoking this imagery of the flood, which it says in Genesis, the waters covered the mountains. It's not that the mountains moved, but they were cast into the sea because the flood waters rose above them. And so you can think about this as um, Christ is the ark that preserves people from the flood and Christ is also the flood or the judgment on Jerusalem because when Christ comes to Jerusalem, the Jewish leaders reject him. They tear themselves away from him and they experience the destruction that naturally ensues when people reject God who is the source of existence. It's not that God comes and actively destroys Jerusalem. It is rather, I think, better to understand this as the Jewish leaders separating themselves from God, from the source of life and experiencing destruction. And this is precisely what happens at the hands of the Romans in the year 70 AD, where Jerusalem is laid siege to and totally wiped out. And it was a ruin for a very long time. And so Christ, in that sense, he is the flood of God's judgment coming on Jerusalem. And the new community that is gathered inside of him will be preserved from the flood and will continue because the Christians obviously continued after Christ's death and resurrection and after the destruction of Jerusalem. But the Jewish rulers at that time did not continue. The Sadducees who were in charge of Jerusalem ceased to exist when Jerusalem was destroyed and have not come back on the scene since. So they were washed away by this flood. So um, these sort of themes or images are important to pay attention to. It's easy to just skip along and say, well, this is just a reference to the Sea of Galilee. It's just a place marker. But I think that it does have this larger implication about uh, where the story is going. So Christ sees Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. I've already mentioned how this is significant because fishermen are people who gather things. This section is about the gathering or the collecting of God's new people, which are the Jews and the Gentiles. This is the new community of God. And so there's that part that's significant, but also in Jeremiah, it speaks about God sending out fishermen to gather Israel from exile. So this is very fitting uh, with what we're going to see. Um, where the the disciples are tasked essentially with, even though the Jews are back in 
Jerusalem, there is this state of exile that they're in because there is this distance between them and God and an inability for them to comprehend who Christ is. And so Christ is using these fishermen very intentionally to uh, connect with this Old Testament story, but also to show in a very tangible way what he is about, that he's taking people, that gather things, and what is he going to do? He's going to gather people. So this is also important. Um, the reference to Peter, James, and John coming up here. Um, we've just seen Andrew and Peter who are brothers, but then there's James and John who are brothers. This is significant because um, these are the first disciples that Christ calls, and Peter, James, and John in particular are the inner circle of Christ's disciples. So um, there are certain moments in the gospel where it's just Peter, James, and John that will accompany Christ to different events. And so there's the resurrection of the little girl that happens, and then there's the transfiguration, and then there's the prayer in Gethsemane where it's just Peter, James, and John that accompany Christ. So by um, having them called first it shows their significance in the story and then andrew he's like almost as significant but not quite so he's there at some moments not there at others but really the main disciples in the gospel of mark are peter james and john they are also the only ones that receive nicknames from christ and you can think about um peter james and john being significant in in two ways so one is with the story of David in the Old Testament, he had mighty men, and there were three in particular that were very significant, and they were known as the three. And so it's just really cool that Christ gathers these disciples, and there's three that are significant, and then that shows that Christ is the center point of history. He's like the central reality on which David and his mighty men were patterned. But also, you can think about the patriarchs of Israel, who are called by God to be fruitful and multiply, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, again, three, and two of them got nicknames. So Abram was renamed Abraham, and Jacob was renamed Israel. And so it's, again, this really lovely connection with Peter, James, and John, three in number. They all receive nicknames, and they're all called to be fruitful and multiply by making disciples and by gathering this new people of God. So, um, I find those connections really lovely. So then from there, it says in verse 18, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the, the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So in verse 18, it says, and immediately, and throughout Mark's gospel, it will use this word immediately a lot. And then it kind of falls off in Jerusalem. So you hear immediately, immediately, immediately throughout the whole text. And then in Jerusalem, it ceases to really function. And there's two ways that you can understand that. So one way is that the narrative is just pushing us along to Jerusalem, because this is where the main action happens, namely, Christ reveals his identity. And then when you think about immediately from a theological perspective, it's very fitting for Mark's gospel because the whole gospel is about the revelation of the Son of God, which happens at the crucifixion primarily. And when Christ speaks about this revelation, it's in Mark 13, and he talks about it as something sudden that happens unexpectedly. And on one hand, this is the crucifixion of Christ, which he warns the disciples to be alert to and to pay attention to so they don't miss it but then there are these concentric circles where for the disciples their identity will also be revealed immediately in the sense of it's a sudden test that is unexpected that shows who someone is and you can think about this in terms of your own life when you suddenly go through something that's difficult that presses you um, sometimes it reveals really good things in you that are drawn out. Sometimes it reveals really disordered things in you that need to be corrected. And so this word immediately is very fitting for the overall genre of Mark's gospel, which is the revelation of Christ on the cross, which happens immediately. It's suddenly, it's unexpected, but also our own identity is revealed in these sudden tests that happen immediately. So I think that the uh, word on one level, it's just 
pushing us towards Jerusalem. This is where the main action happens. But on sort of a theological level, it gets to the point that at Jerusalem, it's Christ's identity that is revealed, which happens immediately. And that this is also how our identity is revealed in these immediate moments of testing. And this is the case for the disciples. It is also the case for us. And you probably know people in your life where you've seen them under pressure and you realize just how amazing they are because when the world squeezes them, light shines out of them. And you might think that darkness would kind of like ooze out of them in these moments of pressure, but it's actually there that the light shines um, most brightly. So I think we can take that word um, in this theological sense. Now I'm in verse 21. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority as, and as not one of the scribes. So Christ is contrasted with the teachers of the Mosaic Law, and he um, has this teaching that's astonishing to people because he is God incarnate. He is not just a teacher of the law, but he is the law itself embodied, which is amazing. Also, he performs signs or acts of power which validate his teaching. So in contrast to the scribes and the Pharisees who might say things, Christ not only says things, but does things and shows that he is truly God incarnate. And I think the main sign, the main act of power that Christ performs in Mark's gospel is his resurrection from the dead. So he's been saying all these different things that are quite astonishing in Mark's gospel in terms of losing your life to find it or picking up your cross and following Christ, which just fly in the face or seem to fly in the face of common sense. But it seems like one way we can understand the resurrection is Christ saying to his disciples, I know you guys don't understand what I'm saying. I know you don't really believe that there is life after death and that you have to serve the least of these to become great. But I'm going to tangibly show you in myself that this is the way reality unfolds. And I will go to death and then rise again to prove that I am speaking truthfully. And evidently, there's the more objective side of the death and resurrection of Christ where he is extending life itself to those who have died. But then I think there's this subjective side where it's like a proof or a validation that what he was saying is true and trustworthy. And this is in part what ennobles the disciples to then go out and become martyrs, which is hinted at in Mark's gospel, but we don't see the martyrdom occurring. It's later in church history that this plays out. So the fact that Christ's acts align with his words or validate his words is part of what it means that he teaches with authority and not as one of the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? So there's this man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit. This is significant because this is the first time Christ um, encounters the Jewish people, as it were, and it's really the first um, miracle or sign that Christ performs for the Jews. And this is significant because when Christ later encounters the Gentiles, the first sign that he performs for them is also the exorcism of an unclean spirit because the demoniac is the first Gentile uh, that Christ heals. Um, and here you've got the first Jew being someone with an unclean spirit. So whether it's Jew or Gentile, they both have an unclean spirit that needs to be cast out. And so this makes me think, hmm, perhaps these healings are not just about these individual people, but perhaps they're playing into this larger picture of Christ creating a new community and how he has to drive out the unclean spirit from the Jewish people, but also from the Gentiles. And this makes, I think, good sense given the Old Testament where you have all these prophets who will perform tangible signs of something that is more of a, a hidden reality. And so, for instance, you have Ezekiel construct a little model of Jerusalem and lay siege to it to represent what is going to happen to Jerusalem at the hands of foreign invaders. Or you have Jeremiah who has this loincloth and he buries it and then he takes it out and it's meant to show this uh, symbolic reality of the state of Israel. And this is the same thing that happens. He sees like these good figs, these bad figs, and it shows the state of Israel as well, like their spiritual condition. And he goes to a potter's house and the potter has to like 
discard some pot or like reshape it. And again, these are all like images of what is occurring on a more hidden level in Israel. They're um, tangible expressions of something that's harder to picture. And so I think with Christ's miracles in general, we should take them that way, that they are like obvious, tangible examples of what Christ is accomplishing on a larger level. And they generally all have to do with Christ's resurrection from the dead, which heals humanity, which drives out the unclean spirits from humanity. So we should have that in our focus and not just be concerned with the individual person here, but more about the general sense of what Christ is accomplishing and how these are ways to illustrate that to us, but also with the driving out of the unclean spirit from the Jewish man in particular, I think it represents the uh, cooperation or demonic possession of the Jewish leaders with unclean spirits, because it's evident when you read Mark that the scribes, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are not aiming at God, that they have um, become complicit in something that is wicked and evil and perverse. And so there's this possession or cooperation with evil that's happening at the level of the Jewish leaders. But then I think down the ladder, it's the same with the Jewish leaders being the unclean spirit that is possessing or taking hold of or cooperating with the Jewish people. And with the language of possession, you do want to be careful because in scripture, it is always a cooperative endeavor. It's not that these spirits just come in and like take the people. It's rather expressed in the sense that the people are cooperating with the evil spirit and there is this illicit union that is going on. And this is the same way that it speaks about uniting with evil in Proverbs as like a, a prostitute that you uh, join with. Or it's the same language in the story of Cain and Abel where Cain um, has this union with an evil spirit as well. So just... Um, when you hear the word possession, it can be a little bit misleading. Think of it more in the sense of cooperation with evil. And this is the state of Israel in general, that the Jewish people are cooperating with the Jewish leaders and the Jewish leaders are cooperating with these hidden wicked spirits. And when Christ comes to the synagogue and casts out this unclean spirit, it represents or shows that or illustrates that reality with something very tangible. Then the spirit says to him, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. It's interesting that none of the humans in Mark's gospel recognize Christ's identity until the crucifixion where the centurion says, truly, this was the son of God. But the uh, evil spirits do have a sense of Christ's identity. This title, Holy One of God, is very similar to how God the Father is referred to in um, Isaiah, or you could just say God in general is referred to as the Holy One of Israel. So there's this close association between the title given here for Christ, Holy One of God, and the uh, title of God in the Old Testament, Holy One of Israel, which I think shows that Christ is God incarnate. It's a very similar title that's being used for him. But then I think the reason the evil spirit has a sense of Christ's identity is because the spirit is this hidden reality or entity that has a sense of the other hidden things. And I haven't talked about it in this video, but in other videos, I've sometimes spoken about how there are these obvious things, there are these hidden things. This is a way to think about what we aim at as humans and the hidden things you can think of in terms of God, who is the most hidden, human hearts, that is like the center of who they are that has to be revealed to you. If you want to have a relationship with a human, they have to reveal themselves to you. God has to reveal himself to us. We can't just like pry into who he is. Uh, the future is hidden. Again, it has to reveal itself to us. We don't know what the future holds. And then meaning is also typically hidden. So if you think about the meaning of dreams or the meaning of texts or the meaning of parables in terms of how scripture frames those things, in especially the Old Testament, but also the New Testament, these are often hidden things where we have to read between the lines to understand what the meaning is. So those are the things that I consider as hidden that um, make up or constitute a meaningful human existence. Like we aim at those primarily and then we use the obvious things in life like fame and glory and power and the physical objects around us as supports to those things. That seems to be what it means to be like a mature person. 
but these evil spirits exist in that sort of hidden level, as it were. And perhaps this is why they have some awareness of Christ's identity, because Christ is God, the most hidden one who instantiates himself or becomes obvious to humans in the incarnation. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsed him, and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. So Christ says to the spirit, Shut up, be quiet, come out of him. And I think the issue here is timing, because you can think about things in scripture that are good, but are bad because of improper timing. So they're like good in themselves, but they need to be received at the proper time. And this seems to be the case with Christ's identity, which is good. It's good to know that he is the Holy One of God, but this is going to be revealed at the cross. That is the appropriate time for it to be revealed where Christ chooses to do so. And the demon or the unclean spirit is trying to grasp this prematurely, which is, again, the nature of evil, that it tries to grasp things prematurely. And then you can think about some Old Testament examples of this with the Garden of Eden, where there was the fruit that was good because everything in the garden was good. And yet God said to Adam and Eve not to eat it. And when the church fathers interpret that, often they say that the fruit would have been eaten by Adam and Eve at a particular time when they had matured. But the problem was they didn't wait and they took the fruit prematurely and consumed it. And this is what made it detrimental. So the fruit in itself wasn't bad, but the timing was bad. And then you can think too of the story of Joseph when he is tempted by Potiphar's wife and rejects that. And then later in the story, he marries Potiphar's daughter. And the way I take that is you have two things that are very similar, Potiphar's wife, Potiphar's daughter, and the good thing is what is uh, waited for rather than taken prematurely because Potiphar's wife is the representation of folly and taking things prematurely and Potiphar's daughter is more so the representation of wisdom and waiting for the appropriate time to receive things rather than to grasp them. And this also then plays into this bigger picture of uh, God raising people up versus people grasping things and try to, trying to take them for themselves. So again, in the Old Testament, you have the example of the um, Ark of Noah, which is raised above the mountains and it is like a tower in terms of its height. And God raises that up. Whereas you have the Tower of Babel, which is much more humans trying to grasp something for themselves and doing it prematurely. And so it's not that towers are wrong because you can think of the um, Ark as a tower raised above the mountains, but it's necessary to do it at the proper time. And so the um, Tower of Babel was a premature attempt to do that, and it wasn't focused on God. It was focused on trying to um, have humanity make a name for themselves. And then you can see the same thing with the giants in the Old Testament who raise themselves up, are portrayed in a very wicked way, versus David, who is short of stature and is raised up by God to be the king of Israel and also slays the giants. So um, you just have these two ways that are constantly represented in scripture as like the way of life or the way of death, those that wait to be raised up versus those who grasp things prematurely. And so then this all ties in with this unclean spirit who is trying in typical fashion to grasp things prematurely. And that's why Christ says, be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. So you can see here that the crowd says it's a new teaching and it's with authority because it has this sign that accompanies it. It's not just Christ speaking, but it's Christ doing and showing that what he is speaking is true because of this powerful act that he performs. It's really similar to, again, just to bring in the Old Testament to this, um, Moses, when he's sent to the Israelites, he's given these different signs to convince them that what he is saying is trustworthy. So he puts his hand in his garment, takes out his leprous, puts it back in, takes it out, it's clean, uh, throws down a staff, it becomes a snake. These things are meant to convince the Israelites that what he is saying is trustworthy. And it's the same with other prophets in the Old Testament. And the reason for that, remember, is that Christ is the center point of history. So he's the, the main um, core and the other things are like um, 
concentric circles around Christ that participate in him. And this response of amazement is very typical for crowds in the Gospel of Mark, and I think it's because they are encountering the very center point of history. They are encountering God incarnate. So, of course, they're going to be amazed at this. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. So, this reference to his fame spreading is indicative of Christ gathering this new community of Jews and Gentiles, like people are becoming aware of him, they're going to be gathering around him, he's going to be growing in popularity, but also when you read the story of Joshua conquering the promised land, his fame spreads throughout the land. When you read about uh, David slaying the Philistines and being the proper king of Israel, his fame spreads throughout the land. And so Christ is at once, like Joshua, establishing the promised land, which is the rule of God in people's hearts. We've just seen this by him casting out the unclean spirit, but also it's connected with David because David was the true king of Israel and Christ is the true king of Israel. Remember, this is a meaning of the term son of God. Sons of God in the Old Testament were kings. Christ is the true son of God. As they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Notice this is an image of the resurrection. So she's laying down, Christ grabs her, lifts her up. And there's lots of stories throughout Mark's gospel where Christ will uh, heal someone and the manner in which they're healed is a picture of the resurrection because it is the resurrection that fundamentally heals humanity. Then the fever left her and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. So again, there's this issue of timing with the demons where they're trying to grasp something prematurely. But then there's this lovely image because it's at evening at sundown, so it's in the darkness. Then these people come to Christ and these people can be characterized as being enveloped in darkness. Darkness can mean, can mean like confusion. It can also mean wickedness. Um, often those who are wicked are confused. We'll see that later in Mark's gospel. But in particular, with the sick and the possessed, with the possessed, it's, it's sort of more evident that they're in darkness because they're cooperating with an evil spirit. But then sickness too can be thought of as darkness, not in the sense that these people have done something evil or sinful and then they're being you know, visited with sickness because of that, but rather God is the source of existence. And when we stray from God or you know, we live in a world that has strayed from God, maybe that's a better way to say it, and because of that, we experience deterioration and sickness. But as we're brought closer to God, we experience wholeness and union. And we have to be careful because evidently Christ says those who follow him will uh, suffer and experience difficulty. But this is a, a purifying fire that turns people into who they're meant to be. Whereas the sickness that Christ is combating is more so something that's just deteriorating people. So there's two senses in which people can suffer. And when the sick are brought to him, it's like those in darkness being brought to the light. Because when uh, Christ is baptized, just remember that the structure is very similar to uh, the creation account in Genesis, where there's a voice that speaks in Genesis, it says, let there be light. And in Christ's baptism, it says, this is my beloved son. And so there's a connection be between Christ being the beloved son and Christ being the light of the world. And so you have Christ here as the light shining, healing those who are sick or possessed with demons. And again, this is connected with the Old Testament, with Isaiah, which speaks about the God of light shining on those who are in darkness, shining on those who are um far from God, not necessarily because of their own individual actions, but because the world as a whole has veered away from God and needs to be healed and retrieved by him. That the forgiveness of sins, you can say this, I mean, we'll, we'll see this later in Mark's gospel as well. It, the forgiveness of sins is to, really about Christ as life itself, reaching out to those that are experiencing the lack of life and bringing them back to life. 
So that's what we see here with Christ at the evening, healing those who are sick or possessed with demons. Now I'm in verse 35. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. Um, throughout scripture, it speaks about rising up early in the morning to pray and seek God. It speaks about this in Psalms and uh, wisdom literature. It speaks about this uh, with Joshua as well as well as other leaders in Israel's history who would rise early to pray and to seek God. It seems like this is a way to orient ourselves as people that the first thing we do when we get up is we pray because praying is like aiming. It's putting God in the proper place and aligning ourselves with him so that the rest of our day will unfold in relation to God. So I think in general, this is a very wise practice for anyone listening to this to do is to just, if at all possible, get up and pray and make that your first priority in the day so that you are aligning yourself and aiming at God. But then more generally, um, Christ, as we've seen, is the light. And so by him going out in the darkness and praying, uh, there's two things that come to mind. One is that you know, prayer for Christ and for us too is communion with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And on with Christ, it's obviously much more profound because God, he is God um, inherently, whereas we who are uh, participating in Christ are only God in the sense of um, by grace, not by nature. You can say it that way in terms of Orthodox theology. But Christ, by going out into the darkness and praying, it's like he's extending the kingdom of God into the realm of darkness. And we've just seen that. So I think that's one way to take it. But then there's a sense in which when it's still dark, Christ is alert. When other people are sleeping, Christ is awake. And this could be connected with Christ being the one who reveals the hidden things of God to humanity. Because later in the gospel, in Mark 13, Christ will tell the disciples to remain awake to remain alert. And then at Gethsemane, when it's dark, they are sleeping. They are unable to remain alert. And so Christ is the one who is awake, who is alert, who is perceptive to the hidden things of God because he is God and will re reveal these things to humanity and not just keep them to himself, which is what we see in the story. It's like he goes out and he prays and then he says, let's go around to the other towns, which seems to suggest let's go spread this to the other people because this is a section about the Jews and the Gentiles being united as one community in Christ. So there's a lot that you can take out of this early morning prayer of Christ. And Simon and his companion, companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. So Galilee is a region mixed of Jews and Gentiles. So very fitting that Christ is in this region at the uh, beginning of his ministry. Now we're in verse 40. A leper came to him, begging him and kneeling. He said to him, if you choose, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I do choose, be made clean. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. So there are stories in the Old Testament of um, people being cleansed from their leprosy, uh, particularly someone comes to Elisha and Elisha tells him to go bathe in the Jordan River. And this is what cures the man of leprosy. And so you can think then of Christ as uh, the living waters of God that cleanse people from the things that defile them or are corrupting them. He washes these things away. Um, this is like a way that we can also understand baptism because baptism is like a miniature flood. And through baptism, we participate in Christ's death and resurrection, which washes away the things that have defiled us or made us impure. And it unites us with divinity. But also you can think of this in like really simple terms as a leper would typically defile those that they touched, but Christ's ability to heal overpowers the leper's ability to defile. And this is, again, sort of an image of Christ reaching out to humanity, which he will do through his death and resurrection, to grab those who have uh, walked on the way of death rather than the way of life and reestablish them. 
So immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So here, um, Christ shows that he is not in discontinuity with what came before. So even though he is superior to it because he is the central principle of history and reality, there is continuity with the Old Testament stories, the Old Testament practices. And so Christ doesn't say just go on your way, but go and show yourself to the priests and offer what Moses commanded. So there's this continuity between what Christ is doing and what came before, but nevertheless, there's this superiority of Christ. And then it's pretty fascinating because the man, I'll read this in verse 45 now, uh, he, he doesn't obey, but he went out and began to proclaim it freely and spread and to spread the word so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly, but stayed out in the country. And people came to him from every quarter. So um, two things to mention on this. One that's more spe speculative on my part, but the first thing is just because God heals us doesn't mean we will be obedient. Or just because God performs a miracle in our lives doesn't mean we will be obedient. Obedient. So this is an important lesson because sometimes we can be deluded and think, well, God, if you just did X, Y, or Z, then I would do X, Y, or Z for you. You know, we start to bargain with God, but I think this story shows that even if you were a leper and Christ healed you, you might not pay attention to him. You might not listen. So um, the main thing ultimately is obedience to God and um, being satisfied with communion with God, regardless of what that may or may not mean in the rest of our life because we trust that God is the source of whatever is good and true and beautiful and so if we have him we have everything we need fundamentally but the other thing that I could say on a more speculative level is uh, like why is it that Christ says say nothing to anyone I keep this quiet and I wonder if the reason for this is because the mission of Christ is to heal humanity in a very fundamental way that's not as obvious as this leper. And sometimes we can get caught up with perhaps being healed in the very obvious way rather than in the more like hidden way. And perhaps Christ says to keep quiet just so people get the right idea of what his mission is about. Like Christ could, it's, it's kind of interesting to think about this, that Christ could have gone throughout the world and healed every single person, but he didn't do that. And you wonder why. And it seems like these healings are obvious examples of something that Christ is accomplishing on a bigger, but also a more hidden level. And that there is a sense in which when Christ descends to death, well, it's not just the sense, when Christ descends to death and then rises again, he heals humanity, he restores them to life. But we still undergo difficulty and sickness and suffering. And so perhaps the reason why Christ is saying, don't say anything to anyone is because he doesn't want the people at that time, as well as now, to get the wrong sense, as if Christ is just here to heal the things that are obvious to us and not integrate us with God in a way that's more profound, but also a little more hidden and sometimes harder to understand. So that's just a bit of a speculative reflection at the end of this uh, video, but take that for what it is. In general, this section, as well as the sections we'll see after this, is about Christ creating a new community of Jews and Gentiles. And so just keep that in mind. And then I'll just restate the like big thesis that I've got for Mark's gospel, which is Christ reveals himself as God incarnate, the center point of history, come to judge and save humanity through death and resurrection and create a new community of Jews and Gentiles. So if you appreciated this video, I'd really appreciate it if you shared it with one friend or family member. And uh, there's a question form in the episode description that you can check out if you've got a question about Orthodox Christianity. And in the meantime, I hope that you have a peaceful week. Take care.